So good morning, everybody, uh, and uh, welcome uh, to our webinar, IT Outsourcing with Belarus, Current Situation and Options. I'm Davide Crisione. I'm the founder and the CEO of uh, DC Nearshoring. We, uh, as a company, we are focused only on uh, nearshoring topics uh, related to IT, and we are probably one of the few independent companies acting in this world as advisor and uh, as also um, let's say consultant also bringing companies together with partners worldwide. Um, in our effort to generate value for our customers and to give some, uh, I would say, relevant, interesting and relevant information, we organize on a regular basis um, webinars with, uh, I would say, really key and very, very attractive and skilled people and partners. We've done in the past webinars about Portugal, we've done po uh, webinars about um, the Visegrad states with a deep dive on Poland, and uh, today we will do one on, uh, on Belarus. If you're interested um, to look also at the old webinars we have done, the, you can find them on our webpage, so www.dcnearshoring.com. Then let's come to the webinar of today. Uh, why do we speak about Belarus? Well, there are two main reasons. One is that uh, Belarus is known to be a very attractive country from the IT standpoint. Probably not everybody knows how good Belarus is, what really Belarus can offer, and uh, uh, let's say how many companies already made some major investments there, and they will try to give you here a hint about this part. The second is obviously um, many customers have, are now concerned, have some, have some doubts because of the geopolitical situation, the geopolitical tens tensions. We want to go here and uh, give you a little bit um, uh, some first-hand information about how also the European Union, the German governments are thinking about the, the cooperation with Belarus. I don't, we don't speak obviously about the political part, but about the cooperation with companies in Belarus, the protection investments that have already been done by German companies in Belarus, and uh, also which is the perspective. In uh, doing this uh, webinar with me today, and actually the key speakers will be uh, key people which are all, uh, really have uh, a lot of knowledge into those topics coming from their respective uh, organizations. So we will have at first Stefan Kegebein. Stefan Kegebein is the regional director uh, for Eastern Europe at the German Eastern Business Association uh, in Germany. Germany is called Ausschuss der Deutschen Wirtschaft. And Stefan will really start talking, uh, talking exactly about this part and um, giving us a view on the geopolitical tensions and uh, starting giving also a first hint about the market in Belarus. Then we will have Stefan Hoffmann, who is managing director of North IT Group, but to today we will speak also mainly as a managing director of the German Belarusian Business Club. And uh, Stefan Hoffmann will give us uh, an in deep, uh, in depth view about uh, the IT market, really how big it is, and all those things, how students are good. And, and uh, we're really keen about listening also to that part. At the end, uh, we will have a good end. We'll have Matthias Karius because that will give us the second part after general introduction. Matthias Karius, who has been for many years responsible for the global supplier portfolio of IBM. And Matthias will give us a view about the experience of IBM, who's made in the history, let's say in the time, big investments in Belarus. And this uh, for us is really relevant to understand uh, how and why you selected Belarus, uh, which were the criteria uh, also to select IBA as your, let's say, one of the key partners in Belarus, and um, some stories about what went well, what went eventually less well, the lessons learned. And they were really uh, keen to listen to this from you direct from, from first hand. So, so far from my side, so I keep my introduction short, and then I will then uh, give the word to Stefan Kegebein. Stefan, the floor is yours. Ah, just one thing, sorry. Uh, for questions, please, um, we have saved in the agenda 10 minutes at the end. You can eventually post your questions through the chat. Uh, box or uh, just at the end of the when we come into the session of the questions just raise your hand or just switch on uh, the microphone and then ask directly your question so sorry Stefan now the floor is yours thank you very much uh, Davide, for this introduction um, so my name is Stefan Kegelbein as you mentioned from the German Eastern Business Association 
We are a, a private business association serving as a department for Eastern Europe of the Federation of German Industries. We are working with 29 countries in total, starting in Central Eastern Europe uh, until the Eastern border of Kazakhstan. So 29 countries in total. And my scope of, country are the country, of countries are the countries of the Eastern Partnership. That means uh, Belarus, Ukraine, Moldova, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. Uh, therefore, I'm somewhat engaged with uh, activities uh, with regards to, to Belarus. And my task today is to give you a bit uh, the understanding of uh, how the tensions that we mentioned uh, uh, applying to, to the business uh, sphere and I guess everybody of you heard about uh, the sanctions uh, regime, the restrictions applying uh, to, to Belarus. Uh, and I would like to give you a bit an overview of what is applying and uh, of the consequences um, for business relations. So um, at the moment, we're seeing uh, uh, three types of, of bans or of restrictions, put it like this. Um, one, the European Union issued uh, in last year in, in early autumn um, or introduced uh, um, sanctions on, uh, on persons and on a smaller number of, uh, of um, entities in Belarus. At the moment, we see uh, 166 individuals and 15 entities uh, sanctions, sanctioned. Among the individuals, we have uh, the vast majority of senior administrative or judicial officials and politicians, and some people, uh, or yeah, and the list includes also some businessmen and companies that are considered to be close to Alexander Lukashenko. Um, um, and uh, the sanctions or from this pillar um, restricted uh, EU citizens to do any business with those people and entities. Uh, the people on the list, uh, their assets are frozen in the European Union and they are not allowed to travel and to enter the uh, European Union. So beside this, um, um, beside this personalized uh, sanctions, we have a, a, um, a system on economic sanction that means on sectoral sanctions applying, applying to the sector of uh, tobacco production petroleum products exports, um, uh, potassium chloride exports, potash, and some restrictions on, on um, selling goods from uh, the communication the telephone sector and technology for military use to Belarusian um, uh, citizens. And finally, uh, when it comes to the sectoral sanctions, um, we have some uh, financial restrictions. That means, for example, that the European Investment Bank shall stop all disbursements or payments uh, um, under the existing agreements related to the public sector projects and all existing technical assistance to service contracts to, to Belarus. Um, These sanctions um, um, are yeah, agreed among the European Union, the UK, United States and Canada. And in the meantime, the list of sanctioned people and uh, entities uh, issued by the United States are a bit broader than by the European Union. Um, uh, but this is um, more or less um, uh, the third pillar of the sanctions when it comes to um, um, sector sanctions. And thirdly, we have a ban on, um, on flights from uh, Belarusian airlines to the European Union airspace and vice versa, uh, no direct flights uh, are at the moment in place from EU cities to Belarus. That are the three types of sanctions we have right now um, as a short introduction. Um, but beside this, very important is that the German government, uh, the EU governments and the EU Commission are supporting and fostering further cooperation among private businesses. Uh, the IT business, IT sector in Belarus is one of the sectors since we see mainly private enterprises and private businessmen, they are active. And uh, beside all the um, um, sanctions in place, cooperation with such type of companies is still uh, supported and uh, uh, do, not, um, do not see any, any restrictions or problems. 
Um, what are the implications on business uh, um, of the sanctions? So what we see and observe from our members is, of course, that new projects with sanctioned companies and persons are not possible for, uh, for reasons. Um, we see um, a certain uncertainty when it comes to the fulfillment of contracts from the past with uh, the sanctioned entities. But what we see as well is that B2B relations are still possible and still working uh, despite all political declarations. And when we see on, when we have a look on the IT sector in, in specific, uh, we still see a growth in 2020 and in previous months, uh, um, not only in the country, but with relations to, to, um, to international partners um, as well. What we observe uh, as well is that some um, relocation activities of staff to Ukraine, Poland, or Lithuania uh, was done, but we do not observe a big wave of IT companies leaving the country. So that is what we see. Maybe Stefan Hoffmann can uh, uh, give more insights since he is uh, uh, Minsk always uh, as well. Um, an outlook, and that's the end of my short impulse. We see that there is still an ongoing, ongoing discussion on deepen and widen the sanctions due to the current situation of refugees entering the EU via Belarus. Uh, so today uh, we uh, have a meeting of the foreign ministers of the uh, European member states, EU member states, and the situation in the Eastern Partnership countries and Belarus will be discussed there as well. But if you see the agenda of the foreign ministers meeting, there are no direct conclusion, conclusions expected or on the agenda. And if we apply the experience of how decisions were taken in the past, it is rather unlikely that business relations to private companies like in the IT sector will be affected, affected by deepened or widened sanctions. So of course, it's somehow a bit looking into the crystal ball, but if you apply what happened in the past, um, uh, it's, as I said, unlikely that there will be some restrictions on corporations with the IT sector. Having said this, I'm finishing. And um, to keep it short, and we'll be happy to answer your questions uh, at the end of the session. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Stefan. Uh, I will take over from here on. Uh, David, thank you for inv inviting me for today. Uh, I will give uh, to, uh, a brief overview about how Germany or how uh, the German-speaking countries can benefit from the IT expertise on uh, its own doorstep. But because um, uh, I will speak also on behalf of the Deutsch, uh, Deutsch Belarusian Wirtschafts Club, I will uh, just briefly introduce our club before I'm coming back to IT. We are operating since 1994. We have an, a rep office in Minsk, which I'm representing. And we are carrying out about uh, 20 events per year. We have 50 plus members from Switzerland, uh, Germany, and Austria. And we re represent 10 industries. And uh, today, uh, I'm very happy that also another club member, the IBA group, is uh, here on this meeting. Not to lose time, uh, location Belarus. Yeah, we have in our club five IT members uh, in, in the Deutsch Belarus, uh, Belarus Wirtschafts Club. Uh, and IT is a very, uh, very strong sector here in the, in the country. Um, talking a little bit about the ecosystem. We currently have, uh, or it was uh, the numbers of the uh, last quarter, around about 1,050 residences with uh, about 71,000 employees. In 2020, we had uh, exports uh, around about um, 2.7 billion uh, euros. Uh, and uh, according to the Hightech Park administration, uh, 1 billion US dollar were invested into Belarus, in a Belarusian IT industry. Uh, talking about numbers, in general, uh, I will come back later to this. Uh, we pay for uh, our employees 13% of taxes. We have a flat tax system. 
and uh, we pay uh, social taxes about 34 percent but not more than currently 150 euros per month and uh, what is important for corporations we um, pay only one percent as an equivalent to a corporate income tax we we have to uh, give uh, to the high-tech park administration one percent of our revenues um, so why belarus is so strong in my point of view belarusian um, as state invested in the last 20 25 years or 30 years heavily into the youth and we currently have 15000 uh, mint students mass uh, it natural study uh, or uh, yeah mint is a german word i forgot but people who are studying uh, some technical or mathematical stuff and to really can uh, invite them after university to the um, to the work and they can work they can really uh, create products which uh, are uh, uh, generate benefit for also for the german speaking market um, here i uh, brought you um, a short a brief overview about comparison about the uh, location billows compared with germany and uh, one reason is always when I'm when we are to, uh, when we are working with German um, uh, clients together, Stefan, I'm not afraid that uh, the Germans would take your uh, uh, de uh, developers uh, over. And I say no, it doesn't make actually real sense on a purely finance financial point of view that uh, Belarusian developers moving to Germany. One example here: uh, the living costs in Belarus, as everybody. Uh, will know a little bit uh, lower than in Germany, for example. And uh, when somebody wants to earn here, as an example, 4,000 euros. For a Belarusian company, it, uh, it means that uh, the cost for this guy is about 4,800 euros. And in Germany, even if this guy is married, his wife doesn't work, uh, the total cost, uh, after all, for the company uh, is about 5,500 euros. So difference about um, 800 euros. Now, when this, when this guy is single and want to have the same amount of money, the total costs increasing in Germany already uh, about 4,000 euros. And that's um, what I wanted to show from a financial point of view, the uh, Belarusian state developed a very good uh, ecosystem where it makes sense to stay in the country and to live in Minsk is also not not uh, very very bad the city uh, developed a lot uh, and uh, for people uh, who are earning a decent salary it's very comfortable to live in yeah um Nevertheless, uh, later in the uh, Q&A session, I can go into some more specific questions regarding uh, how it is to be a developer, how, how it is to work in Belarus. Uh, and I'm happy to answer to you to your, your questions. I brought you some examples from my own company where we work together in the small and mid-size uh, business uh, because later IBA Group is uh, quite uh, bigger than my uh, company. They will focus on uh, big industries. And I will just show you how the German Mittelstand uh, profits from the location below us. For the beginning, uh, all these three companies work, uh, working with Belarus, just to keep in mind, I think IBA Group will speak about it later. And I, sh I brought you three examples uh, of uh, what we are doing with German Mittelstand. Um, first of all, um, we doubled our staff uh, every year by 100%. We, we saw a salary increase in 2021. Uh, it's a sign of the end of the pandemic and the the demand from Europe are increasing is very um, The politics 
interfere uh, from my feeling into our IT business. Uh, and we are convinced uh, in doing business in Belarus. And uh, yeah, what we have done, uh, it's a project from the last uh, two years already developing. We're developing a portal for a German uh, client with about 30 employees. The development and the design team is made in Belarus. The conception with the client together from Germany. And uh, the development team is led in Belarus, uh, also the design. It's a very good, fruitful cooperation with a, a German Mittelstand company. The second example, what I wanted to present here is uh, the cooperation of different uh, small and mid-sized IT companies from Belarus with uh, a German one. And uh, I, my, my, my job was here to, to find partners in app development in, uh, in Belarus. We worked with Brest together. We from North IT Group as a managing company of the Belarusian and German work and the uh, business owner from Berlin. And uh, here also about three companies were involved uh, with uh, more than 10 people working uh, remotely together. And last but not least, uh, I would like to show you our own product, what we're currently under development. Also here are 10 persons involved. Uh, we want to do an e-learning uh, product for German schools focused on the um, uh, on uh, the kin uh, on the primary school. As a project lead has our German company, we will launch it on the first of January, and uh, in the hottest phases, uh, we are involved ten persons in three different countries. Why I'm showing this uh, always, or why I'm showing it to you. Um, it is totally possible also for small and mid-sized business to, to use Belarus as a, as a workforce or even as a creative center to work on uh, projects which are usually taking in Germany much longer or cost much more. Our clients have uh, the, the major issues our clients had in the or faced in the past. They, did, they didn't find enough uh, IT workers to fulfill their wishes and uh, with Belarus uh, we have a great ecosystem and we can uh, do the job just uh, contact uh, contact us and uh, also for small and medium-sized business we will uh, do your app or your website yeah if you have some more questions some private questions you can contact me on LinkedIn here you have the QR code and later I am uh, available for the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan. I hope I'm in the timeline. Yes, uh, almost perfect. <laughs> thank Goodbye. you, Stefan Kegeman, and thank you, Stefan Hoffman, for the uh, for the overview about the political situation, the economic situation, the IT part, and some examples on the small medium enterprises. Uh, the next speaker, is, as I was, as I said at the beginning, is Matthias Karius. Um, and Matthias uh, at IBM has been uh, responsible for selecting uh, global um, suppliers on the global scale. Uh, so, Matthias, can you tell us something more? Why did you select also Belarus? What was interesting? Which were the the, the characteristics and the data that that uh, let's say made you decide for the country, and then later also for eventually for IBA as your main partner? I will share one slide from my part. Okay, my name is Matthias Karius. I used to work for IBM for almost 38 years. And basically since 1993, we explored, as you can see on the foil, almost the whole world and looked for suitable software suppliers which IBM could use. And if you watch to Belarus, for example, we first worked together with, with IBA Group. Later on, we had some solutions as well as Astoria in the portfolio. And again, the whole world was explored. I started 
this IBA, at that time they had a different name, but doesn't matter, in 93. And the first project we run over there was, was Custom Pack with four headcounts. And amazing enough, that project is still existing and still running with a larger team. But that's showing you how long-term that, that business could be over there. The small group I belong to inside IBM was, was really testing suppliers, which we found and thought we are suitable with pilot projects to be really on the safe side. So that if we are going out and doing marketing for these suppliers, we are not selling black boxes. We, we really sold suppliers, which really have been tested and we found them absolutely suitable for whatever type of business we built. We had the suppliers and we worked with them together in the area of security, which is, or which was for IBM extremely important. So to make sure that, that security as well as quality like ISO or CMMI and data privacy was completely in place and no client had to worry about his stuff, what he is giving away, or when he allowed the supplier to work on his systems and so on. One point which I still think is extremely important and was mentioned earlier is the connection to the universities. IBA introduced us from the very beginning to the universities and we all work together with the universities. They even ask us what is the future in software? What can we educate? And that was, let's face it, it was for us like paradise because we could say, hey, we might need this and that, and this and that on, on programmers later on. Even IBA was installing some, some labs at the university. They invested really into the university to train the people on their equipment with, with their software and they even brought teachers over there to mention, for example, the universities in Minsk had a lab for, for Lotus Notes, for Lotus Notes databases and things like that. And that was really important. And again, like paradise. In 1999 or 2000, IBA and IBM decided together to have the headquarter of IBA group located in Czech Republic. That was very important because data privacy became more and more important. And a couple of customers did not, not allow to give their software out of the European Union. So that became one of the key things that the headquarter finally was located in, in Prague. But nevertheless, the main development centers stayed in Minsk and, and in, ah, uh, help me out here. I'm too long out of that. <laughs> Doesn't matter. It comes, comes up later in my mind. Another very important thing also was for us, the human factor and the stability of, of that company. IBA, for example, the management team, which I was intru introduced to in 93, is still almost the same, nothing changed. And that's something which I was not used from, from IBM because every second to fourth year, the management chain changed completely. Another point to mention is the very, very low turnover. That means if, if we are running projects with IBA, these projects, these teams are staying together. The turnover rate during my time was between three and 4%, which is extremely low if you compare that to India or China. And that's helping us to keep the investment because if you train a team and the, train, the team is up and running, you don't want that somebody is moving for an extra dollar to another company and you start training all over again. Also, we decided on IBA because IBA from, from the size and from the connections they had turned out to be for, for IBM a one-stop shop. That means they had all the varieties of, of software 
skills available for us. With smaller companies, that's always a problem because they are specialized on this area, the other company is specialized on this area and so on. So IBA could handle everything we needed. And one point about cost, which I think is very important because a lot of people are just discussing cost, but how to measure quality. We have been running, I don't know how many thousands of projects with, with IBA. And if we compare that with, with a lot of other even really big software suppliers in the world, quality is, is the most important part. We have seen a lot of projects where the cost picture from the beginning with another supplier was much better, but they had to to redo that stuff, they had to enlarge the team. So finally, it ended up to be much more costly from these suppliers and IBA never had this situation at all. So cost quality, that's, I would say for, for, for IBM purposes, it was ideal. So I'm almost finished. Yeah, let's go to the question and answer sessions. Well, then, uh, Matthias, I would like to ask a question. You have uh, presented uh, what was done. I will take the, the slide out. Yeah. Is there um, any, let me stop, so that they come back. Is there <laughs> any, um, any uh, let's say, you've been speaking about the developments. I think first that uh, we heard that the engagement is, a, uh, let's say, a, a big engagement, right? It's not mm -hmm. something, I don't know how many people, um, I mean, from the beginning to the top, how many people have been working for IBM? And uh, yeah. As I stepped out in April 2020, we had close to 900 headcounts just for IBM. Okay, this is, this is a lot. Just for mm -hmm. IBM. So that's a huge number. And in that respect, IBA almost was one of the really biggest software suppliers for IBM. Is there in this period of time any critical points you have had? So some crisis that you had uh, overtaken together. I mean, which hints you want to give also to somebody who's going to make an investment? Which are the points somebody should take care of? Let's, let's we thought very know. often that the political situation could kill the business, but all clients understood that extremely well, what's cooking over there, and they all stayed together. Nobody wanted to move out because of the political situation, because the suppliers, well, they can work. Even, even you could... Due to Corona, for example, we had this, this SARS crisis, we had all plans in place already, pandemic plans, and we, we reused them for COVID and everybody went home and we just continued as is, but from the home office. So that was no problem. Mm -hmm. The suppliers have been prepared for that. It's, it's easy, easy going. And the other thing is uh, IBA is, has been working for IBM also for external customers. This is my understanding, sure, right? Sure, sure, uh, sure. Is there any, let's say, uh, vertical sector where you think because of the GDPR and uh, data protection, where this collaboration with, uh, uh, with Belarus, let's say, has been uh, complex, uh, or you had to explain, or you the GDPR aspects have been a little bit, uh, had, had to be taken care of? Uh, with more attention. Let's let's say it this way: banks very often saying, "Wow, oh, that's so critical. So we better do that with IBA Group and Czech Republic because that's European Union." On the other hand, there is a way of filling in certain paperwork and to run it still in Belarus. That's possible. There are regulations to allow that. Okay. So takes there a little is a... longer, but it depends on the slide, on the client. We always have to listen to the client, to, to his needs, and then figure out what is the best way for him to do it. Okay. This is, this is the, those are interesting things, let's say, that uh, there is no real restriction in terms of GDPR 
So nope, there are nope, ways nope, to nope. organize and to get it done. Right. With full exactly. satisfaction afterward also for the customers. And there are no right. limitations, even, I mean, financial sector is one of the key sectors, probably most sensible to those things together, I think, with uh, healthcare. Yep. Uh, so obviously very, very, let's say, uh, strict in terms of GDPR and uh, data protection. Perspective. Yep. Okay, thank you. Then uh, I also had a question for uh, Stefan Hoffman. Um, Stefan? Yeah. Yeah. So I hope you hear me now. Well. Uh, one of, no, yeah, we, we hear you perfectly now. Uh, so one thing that we see quite often is that uh, nearshoring is mainly for German companies, is what we see every day, is a question of, uh, let's say, we need to win the trust of customers. We need to win the trust and to make them customers in Germany feeling uh, safe, secure, that a partner from outside can cooperate. You're working mainly with, let's say, small, medium enterprises. This is the market where you normally move into. Uh, what is your experience? And when you talk about Belarus, which is the reaction and how you can, let's say, transmit to your customers that actually working with Belarus, is that there are some risks, whatever, and probably not different than working with, with uh, partners from whatever in the world, and that those risks can be managed. So what is your experience when you talk to customers about those topics? Um, actually, a very funny experience. Uh, I'm not joking. Uh, a lot of customers think Minsk, when I say we have a uh, development center in Minsk, they think Minsk, uh, it's European Union. And uh, only after we are working six, seven months together, uh, I figured out that Belarus is not in the European Union. Um, uh, I'm working with guys with hand on, on clients who really run their business, who have a problem, who were looking for people uh, already six months, uh, one, uh, 12 months, and don't find the, uh, the tech stack they needed for their solution. And uh, in what was good in the uh, last year, uh, the clients uh, were uh, very supportive. They said as with pandemic, also with the political troubles, everything is okay, but nobody went away. And for them, it's uh, normal. They are uh, happy to work uh, with our, with the Belarusian programmers. And um, I don't see there any problem because our clients, they, they have other issues to think about okay. really. Yeah. So you can win the trust, let's say. Do you see it sometimes that Belarus is in competition, I don't know, with uh, companies with... from, I don't know, from Romania or from Hungary yeah. or from Poland? Yeah. Uh, how do you think, why do you think that Belarus can be even more attractive this, uh, than uh, those countries from Eastern Europe? Um, in your experience, you work mainly there. Um, the mentality is different, but quite similar between uh, Bel Belarusians and especially East Germans. And after you uh, bre broke the ice, uh, they are happy to, to work with us. And of course, we have uh, we have three shareholders and we are all Germans or Switzerians. So they, they trust us because of the shareholder structure. It's also uh, one, one of the reasons they work with us. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Then, then I have a last question for um, Stefan Kigivan. Um, Stefan, uh, with respect to the um, investments of new company, are you there, Stefan? Yes, yes, I'm here. Yeah, okay. With respect to investments of uh, companies in, in Belarus, do you have any, let's say, um, any information about, let's say, you know, uh, if some new companies are coming, they're planning big investments in the IT or maybe also in other industry. Are they now somehow postponing those investments? Waiting? Are they going forward? Depending on the maturity of the project, are they uh, limiting? So, oh, you see that there is any out because you mentioned that actually, uh, I think the bilateral exchange of uh, export was even growing. So, what is your experience? Are you approached by big corporations that are asking for information about Belarus, uh, Belarus, and how they should behave? Um, so, at, at at the moment, it is more uh, taking care of. Uh, of, uh, of the current situation instead of uh, taking care of uh, big, big investments. So we saw until 2019 
we saw um, flowing in more investments and more interest of companies uh, on the Belarusian market. So we have here in, in Germany one uh, interministerial um, committee that approves support for investments. And for 2018 and 19, we saw n um, new, new requests for support of these investments by German companies. And um, um, they were supported in, in this year. So that means uh, back then there really was a political support um, to support companies to go to Belarus. Um, but I guess due to uh, Corona on the one hand, uh, but due to uh, political uncertainty, um, this dynamic uh, decreased in 2020 and 2021. At the moment, um, uh, the business that was in Belarus is still going on. So there's, um, and, but of course, companies uh, having more um, on the screen if there arises um, problems or, or more tensions. But at the moment, we do not see big new, new investments. So I guess um, uh, companies are waiting until times are a bit more, more certain uh, when it comes especially to, to investments. But cooperation without investments um, are still possible, as I mentioned in my, in my impulse. Um, um, of course, companies are looking here and there what is possible and what is not. But um, at the moment, uh, I cannot give a positive answer when it comes to, to big investments into Belarus. Well, thank you so much for your answer. I think this is really open and uh, uh, in-depth, let's say, in terms of knowledge around the topic. So then now I would like to open the, the, the session if there are some questions from the audience. Uh, Peel, uh, please just uh, switch on your microphone and uh, ask your question. Um, so, hi. Yeah, I hear hi, Good morning, David. This is uh, Hiran. I'm based out of Stuttgart, Germany, uh, yeah. part of HCL Technologies. Uh, we are a global IT firm, $10 billion in the company. Uh, Matthias should be aware about it, and many of you. So, uh, my question is to Matthias. Uh, uh, first of all, thanks. Very deep insight, very concise, Matthias. IBM is a very uh, global uh, uh, distributed company. So uh, did you face anything around 24 by 7 operations, Matthias, in Belarus as per the work laws there? Because a lot of our global projects demand that, right? And I have faced this situation in some part of the world where, uh, you know, uh, unlike India, you know, where we work 24 by 7, uh, this has to be like a follow the sun model. Do you think Belarus also supports that? No problem at all. And we have a lot. Oh, sorry, I'm retired. We had a lot of customers which really needed 24 by 7 support. And IBA was easily delivering that to us for, for many, many years. And I'm sure they still do it. Plenty of customers around the world especially out of the US, they needed that hardly. And for them, it was easy because of the time zone shift. Mm -hmm. so, so, but if to answer your question, if there are restrictions, no, they are not. IBA can manage all that stuff. Okay. And uh, uh, in terms of skill sets, uh, you might be aware, I mean, the latest uh, is around full stack right front end back end all that that's been a major change from the past and uh, and you believe that belarus also rises up to that they have enough scale available for full stack sure 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 during my times i had call it waiting list for potential programmers which wanted to apply to iba but they they hired them only on demand so that waiting list was to my knowledge, 1,500, something like that. So there's still plenty of opportunity for every new thing which is coming up. And also IBA, for example, the, the new facility they, they opened a couple of years ago. They have a huge IT center and they are investing extremely into artificial intelligence and things like that. So they are mm -hmm. extremely well prepared. And if it comes to, let's say, legacy systems, it's anyways paradise because you're not finding any other country where they have still maintenance programmer, you know? Yeah. Uh, not, not maintenance, mainframe, you know? Mainframe. So that's, that's another 
key factor because we still have enough old legacy systems out in the world and somebody needs to support that stuff. And the good part is even the university in Minsk is still cranking out mainframe programmers. Okay. And you see language capability, English and German and all um, available there in, in school? Uh, we handled that on team base in the past. For example, if there was a French project for, for a huge French insurance company whatsoever, IBA always managed to have people with French language in there. The same thing for Italian projects. Team mm -hmm. was, was speaking Italian language in German projects, German speaking people. Not all of them, but at least the key people to make it as easy as possible for the clients, you know? Okay. So and the more English, more... almost everybody, and okay. the rest we have to look into depending on the projects. Understood, understood, okay. And uh, uh, the, the model of operation, uh, is it like a work package mode or you can transfer, uh, you know, something like a larger module under their own program management. So what has been more successful with IBM? We can do almost everything. The point here is what does a customer need? Usually a project starts where they are not so trustful, so they are not throwing a complete package over. So they start working with them and after a while, they transfer complete packages. And uh, the management model is also completely different. We had all kinds of versions. For example, for some US projects, we even had a uh, so-called liaison person in the US to work directly with the clients together. Or we had one huge, large German project in the past where Germany sent a guy over to, to IBA, which was sitting there for two, two weeks in IBA's office and coaching his team and two weeks back home, bring up new tasks and going over to Minsk another time for another two weeks. And that continued for, oh, hear me, 20 years like this. Okay. And so that's another system of management and everything also worked extremely well. Okay, I know, I know others also may have to ask some questions, but my last question to you, Matthias, would be the, about the, you know, what do you see is, as a major difference compared to very, very scaled operations of India, right? You, you know the, I know I heard about attrition uh, that I, I'm, I can fully comply to that, but yes, anything, anything else, anything else which is, uh, comes to your mind? As I said earlier, cost and quality. The bean counters, the procurement guys, if they are deciding on where to go, they are just looking at, let's say, at rates, how much does a programmer cost? In what field? So how expensive is that guy? And then they're making a decision. But nobody is really counting quality and face it, counting quality is extremely difficult. So that means you need a test task. You have to check the delivery. Was it done on time? Was it done in cost? Was it done in this and that? So how happy was the client? That's extremely hard to measure. For, for a lot of clients, at the first beginning, IBA looks a little bit more expensive than, than a lot of other suppliers. But in, in, at the very end, there are the winners always. Mm -hmm. Even I've seen projects which we really had to give away to other countries. And after a year, they came back. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Karim. Thank you. I would like to, in the last minutes, eventually also to give the word if somebody else has questions. And uh, thank you for your question, Hiran. Eventually, uh, you have all the also references, mine or ABA, whoever, uh, also of um, uh, Matthias, um, so that we can also go in bilateral discussions after this, this webinar. It would be good, David. I would like to have a dialogue with you, uh, if possible. Perfect. We'll come back to you. Really, really thanks uh, for the questions. Is anybody else from the audience with some questions? We still have a few minutes um, for our call. No questions coming from the audience. Then here, um, uh, as uh, promised, we'll come back to you.
uh, so we can organize bilateral eventually discussions. And uh, thank you then uh, to everybody for uh, joining this webinar and to the speakers, uh, to uh, Stefan uh, uh, Kegebein, Stefan Hoffmann and uh, Matthias Karius. Uh, really thanks for participating, for giving us uh, your time and your knowledge, sharing with us your knowledge. And then I wish you uh, everybody uh, a beautiful day and uh, still uh, a great, uh, great week. It was a pleasure. See you and talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.